Hi, everybody. Good to be with you today. My name is Tim, one of the pastors here at ACC, and I want to welcome you to our service today. Uh, I, my hope and prayer is that God meets with you in a very special and powerful way, and um, that you, wherever you are today, you experience his presence, his kindness, his love, his forgiveness to you. Um, if you are new, make sure you go to our uh, I'm New tab on our website, and there's a connect card there. We'd love to find out a little bit more about you and see if there's ways that we can help serve you better. So if you'd like to do that, that'd be great. I've got a few announcements I want to draw to your attention. First is our kids' ministry is going to be, uh, we're all, all excited to get going in the fall. And we need to know if your kids are going to be involved in our, our ministries on Sunday morning. So um, up to grades one to our uh, children up to grade two, uh, you can sign up uh, on a registration form. There's a registration form online under the ministries tab, and then kids ministry, you can find it there. Or there's uh, in front of Christie's office here at the church. Make sure you check on that. Also, we need volunteers. We can't run this without volunteers. So uh, be asking Jesus now if this is where he wants you to go. Uh, we really could use your help. And we want uh, to be able to start the fall with a successful children's ministry. And we need people to step up and serve in order to make that happen. Uh, second thing, we have a baptismal service scheduled for August 29th. Uh, we just had one. We had five people baptized. It was awesome. We want to do another one on August 29th. And uh, so if you'd like to be a part of that, please let us know uh, at the church office. And um, uh, Jim's going to be doing, uh, Pastor Jim will be doing a uh, baptism conversation class on August 15th. That's a Sunday and uh, during the 11 a.m. service. So make sure you be a part of that so you can find a little bit more what's going on there. Uh, recently, uh, July 4th, uh, there were some fires set to uh, one of our churches in Calgary, uh, the House of Prayer Vietnamese Alliance Church. And uh, some extensive damage was done to the outside of the building. And uh, uh, police believe it was arson, uh, maybe uh, directly related to the, um, uh, the residential school tragedy. Uh, um, people reacting to that, we're not exactly sure. Uh, but um, if we'd like to help out to support one of our sister churches, then you can do that. Just mark your offering um, to the uh, House of Prayer Alliance Church. And uh, we'll make sure that uh, donations will go to help them to rebuild. And then last, uh, on June 28th, uh, City Council has been looking. We've had our land uh, before the City Council. We've had it there for uh, quite some time. And on June 28th, uh, they voted to pass uh, the rezoning of the land. So that is great news. And we'll be working with our district executive committee here with the Christian Missionary Alliance in Alberta to get the funding. And hopefully that will be done before the, uh, uh, just shortly after the middle of August. So thank you so much for praying. Thanks so much for your generous giving and for um, uh, just uh, being faithful and sticking with us on this. So excited to see what God's going to do with the kind of doors he's going to open for us. Well, we're going to uh, turn our time to some worship here in just a second, singing together. And, uh, but I want to read to you from Ephesians 1. It says this, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of, the, of his mighty strength, which he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that can be invoked, both in the present age and in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is what God has for us. This is who we get to worship. So let's do that now. We'll start by singing uh, this song, The Love of God. Let's sing together. The love of he is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond 
the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell the guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to it his erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin
hands empty praise Treasures that fade are never enough You came along Put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you And I'm not afraid To show you my weakness Failures and flaws, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who cares You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who cares You turn mourning to dancing You turn beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who cares You're the only one who cares You're the only one who cares Oh, there's nothing better than Shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into goddess. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing 
better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. In just a minute, we're going to turn our hearts to God's Word and to hear what He might want to say to us through His Word, and Pastor Jim will be speaking. But before we do that, uh, I'd like to pray for us as a congregation, for us as a church, that God would meet with us. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come to you today, uh, grateful people that uh, your love for us is so fantastic. Uh, your, um, your grace is incomparable, uh, and you've revealed that to us through your kindness, through Jesus Christ. And for that, we're very grateful. And I would ask for each one of us at ACC, for each person here that's watching online, that you'd give us a deeper understanding of your love for us. Yeah. We would know how great it is, uh, how, great you, how much you care for us, how much we're on your mind. Lord, I pray that you'd increase our desire to live holy lives. That whatever you point out sin in our lives, we would be quick to respond, quick to confess, quick to turn away from sin. That we wouldn't toy with it and play with it. We would be done with it. We would renounce it. And we would live lives worthy of the calling that you've given us. Lord, I ask that you'd help us to love our neighbors, to reach out to those who are far from you, who don't know anything about your incredible grace, your overwhelming love, your hope and your peace that we would be kind to our neighbors and show love to them, and that you would open up doors of opportunity for us to share the reason behind our faith so that others could come to know you like we know you. We are so fortunate. And we want to share the goodness of you with others. Lord, I know many are struggling with health, and people in my own family that are struggling with health, and we lift them up to you right now. Thank you that you know each one. That you care about each one. And people struggling with finances. Lord, I pray that you would teach us to rely on you, to trust you for our daily bread for each day. And Lord, I pray for unity amongst us. You know, there's lots to tear us apart, lots of reasons why we can pick a side and, and, uh, and have an us and them mentality. Uh, we are in this together. And so I pray that you'd help us to set aside our arrogance and our pride and to respond in humility and love with those around us, especially with those in the community of believers, so that the world will know that you exist through our love. Lord, as we turn our hearts and our minds now to your word, to this new series that we're starting, the series of the seven I am statements that you made, Jesus, as we turn our hearts to that, I pray that you would move us and, and challenge us in powerful ways. Help us to lean into you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Jim. I'm one of the pastors here and glad to be able to open the Word of God uh, with you today. I wonder if you might have a ring on your finger that has a diamond on it. I just invite you, if you do, just to take a look at that. And as you look at it and move it around, you see uh, it just glistens and it glows and it sparkles. There's a, uh, and of course, why is that? Uh, it's because there's a lot of facets on it and the light strikes it and it just uh, shines out uh, glorious and beautiful. And uh, today we're launching a new series on the I Ams of Christ. Uh, like I am the door, I am the bread, I am the way, the truth, and life, all from John's Gospel. 
And each one of these I am's really is a facet uh, of Christ our Lord, and they make him just shine beautiful and radiant uh, and show him to be the altogether uh, lovely one. And so in each one pictures an attribute of our great God. And so today we're going to start with the first one. These are all in John's gospel, all seven of these I am's. And the first one we come across there is in John 6 and verse 35. I invite you to turn there if you have a copy of the word of God or uh, online or, or just uh, listen as uh, uh, we uh, read. And the other thing you, you note here uh, is each of these I am's actually uh, refers to some uh, point of deity of Christ. Uh, in the Old Testament there, you may well recall uh, Moses uh, was appeared to in the burning bush. God showed himself through the burning bush. And Moses said, uh, when I go to the people, who shall I say sent me? And, and what did God say? He said, say I am sent you, or I am that I am, uh, the self-existent one. He is the one that sent you. And, and of course, each of these I am's reveal uh, something of our, our great God uh, as well. And so it's, it's just a marvelous study of the who Jesus is, uh, the facets of his uh, character, uh, because it helps us answer the big question, who is uh, Jesus Christ? So John 6, uh, verse 35, we'll start to read in verse 25 uh, for today. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Father, we thank you for your living word. A living words uh, uh, to dying men and women, boys and girls and teenagers. And so would you feed us indeed the bread of heaven, the living word from heaven for our souls, that we might live uh, now and live eternally and know the wonder of your life in us, Lord Christ. Thank you for hearing us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this week uh, I made bread for the first time in my life. I should really say I made bread uh, thanks uh, to Teresa's coaching. Uh, it was uh, a very much a learning experience. I mean, you've got to know how much flour to put in. You've uh, you got to punch here, and then you uh, pinch and make the buns, and there's just, yeah, all kinds of stuff. But the good news is uh, the buns didn't turn out like hockey pucks. Uh, they're very edible, and we're really quite uh, enjoying it. And bread, as you know, is foundational uh, to living. Uh, to life all over the world, even today. They might not have Canada number one hard wheat, but uh, they, uh, are the world over, bread is, is popular. And throughout history, it's been a staple of life. And certainly it was true in Jesus' day, uh, because it was the one thing every person had, whether you're rich or poor, people had bread. Now today to us, it's uh, quite optional, because uh, there's people with allergies and people with food preferences and choices and all that, but uh, uh, it really is a, the staple of life uh, the world over. And so here in, in our text, Jesus, the master teacher, he takes uh, this uh, physical uh, entity and he uses it to demonstrate a spiritual uh, reality. And the big idea we see uh, Jesus making is he's saying, I am the bread of life is how he reveals himself. And he demonstrates that first of all, declaring, by declaring number one, uh, don't work for food that spoils. Notice verse 26, uh, very truly I tell you, you're looking for me, 
not because you saw the signs I performed, because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils. What's he talking about here? What uh, is he referencing? Well, if you know the whole context of John, the start of uh, John chapter 6, actually is a story of the feeding of the 5,000. And of course, they'd eaten these loaves and had their fill. And so that's uh, what he's referring to. Uh, basically, Jesus had been out teaching and uh, healing, uh, performing all kinds of miracles, and it was getting late in the day. People were languishing, getting tired. Uh, and so he said to Philip, uh, uh, how can we uh, feed these people? And, and Philip said, well, man, we can't make enough money to feed them uh, and for a, a long time. And, and then Andrew said, well, there's somebody here, a young guy who has uh, uh, two, uh, two fish and, and five loaves of bread. But that really doesn't amount to anything uh, neither among this uh, large group. And then you know what happened. He took it uh, and he blessed it and he broke the bread and the fish and passed it out. And they just kept on eating and eating and eating. And uh, at the end of it all, they filled up 12 baskets. The number of translations say 12 large baskets uh, were filled, which just emphasizes the, the sufficiency of Christ. Uh, they all were fed uh, this bread. They all were supplied. There's enough of Christ uh, even for all of us today and for the whole uh, world. Uh, this shows the amazing, marvelous uh, grace of our God uh, in uh, blessing uh, people. And so this is what uh, he says there in this text. Uh, However, don't go for a free lunch, he says, uh, but rather work for food that endures to eternal life. And so the first point he makes is don't work for food that is just temporal, uh, that is just perishable, it's stuff that just fills your stomachs. Uh, your ap physical appetites, your passions. Don't just settle for a free lunch, but go for ultimate satisfaction. Go for soul uh, fuel, for food for your hearts. Uh, don't just settle for food that spoils. Don't settle for false bread. Now, what is uh, false bread? Uh, what uh, might uh, a food that perishes uh, involve? Well, one of the best texts I know describing this is what we read again by John in, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Uh, Jesus says, or John says, do not love the world or anything that's in the world. For if anyone love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and he lists three things, the lust of the flesh, uh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of this world. And so he's saying the coveting from our flesh, uh, that which panders to our appetites, uh, is not of the Father. Uh, that which feeds the lust of our eyes or uh, the coveting of our eyes uh, or entices us uh, is part of this world. Uh, and as well, the pride of life is uh, the grandeur, uh, the vain grandeur we can find or glamour from uh, this life. He said, this is uh, not what lasts. It's just passing uh, because he says, uh, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world and the world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Uh, don't uh, waste your energies on food that spoils, on false spreads, on activities. Maybe, maybe it's a binge of Netflix for the whole day or whatever. It might, I don't know. You might think that's going to revive you and renew you, but uh, don't spend your life on stuff that spoils, but spend it uh, looking for that which lasts forever. Uh, don't spend your life looking even for security on this earth. You know, uh, there's all kind of advertisements out there that, uh, well, this is our secure investment. This is what you need uh, for the rest of your life. And uh, we can easily get caught up with that. But the fact is, all that glitters is not gold. Uh, C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, all that is not eternal is eternally useless. And this is what Jesus is saying here. Don't work uh, for that bread that spoils. Uh, because all that is not eternal is eternally useless. And so the big idea that Jesus reveals here is he is the bread of life. And number one, he demonstrates this by declaring, don't work for food that spoils. That's temporal, that's passing, part of this world. Uh, but work for food that is eternal, uh, that which satisfies uh, forever. He says, uh, for that which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And so uh, the, really the million dollar question is what investment uh, is going to be giving you returns for uh, not just this life, but the life to come? Uh, uh, what investment will be working for you uh, a billion years uh, from now? And the short answer Jesus gives is me. Uh, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And so the shorter answer is me. Uh, eat this bread, receive 
uh, me. Of course, the Jews bring up manna in the wilderness. You remember the story of manna, right? Uh, they were 40 years in the wilderness, and every day God provided this uh, bread, this food on the, on the ground, and if they collected extra, they, it rotted, and if they collected enough, it lasted, and every day was a picture of God's daily bread. He gave to them, uh, and then it stopped, when, of course, when they reached the, the promised land. And so Jesus said, uh, uh, of course, this didn't really come from Moses, even though he's your great leader, but it came from my father. The message paraphrase puts it this way. Jesus responded, the real significance of that scripture is not that Moses gave you bread from heaven, but that my Father is right now offering you bread from heaven, the real bread, the bread of God that came down out of heaven and is giving life to the world. And so he says, I am that bread of life. Keep on eating of me because Jesus is bread alone, only the true bread. And your total satisfaction is to be found in eating me. The invitation is, uh, once you've found Christ, it's not the end of your search, but it's to be an ongoing uh, search and a seeking, because there's always, the good news is there's always more of Him, and more of His grace, more of His justice, more of His mercy, more of His righteousness. There's always uh, more that we can find in Him. Sometimes uh, I try to imagine what heaven will be like. I mean, can you begin to comprehend what it would be like? It's just uh, unbelievable. You think about streets of gold, you think about the angel of course, uh, you think about seeing friends you, you've never seen before. Uh, you think about your new home. It's just, it's incredible. But most incredible is that God himself is there. And we'll see Christ face to face, the lion, the throne, and the lamb. And from it is emanating all the wonder and grandeur of God. It's, it, it's just, I, I, I just can't imagine what it would be like. Uh, I mean, just think about one of God's attributes. Think about, for example, his faithfulness. Uh, I dare say I might spend all eternity just trying to delve into his faithfulness or being submersed by that. Or, or you could spend all eternity uh, probably just trying to get to the bottom of realizing his justice uh, or his wisdom. It's, it's just absolutely uh, mind-boggling uh, when you think about him. And here we have this I am of Christ. I am the bread. I am your sufficiency. I am uh, your all in all. Uh, I am the one who satisfies you uh, completely, and I desire to do that. But the, of course, the point of the matter is we can try to settle for that which isn't bread, which doesn't really satisfy. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition. When infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum, because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And so as we summarize, the big idea here is that Jesus reveals he is the bread of life. Uh, and he demonstrates this by declaring, first of all, don't work for food that spoils, but rather uh, work for the food that is eternal, which prompts the big question, uh, the application question where we're going to camp in closing uh, that the Jews put to him there uh, in verse 28. And then they asked him, what well, must we do to do the works God requires? Because, of course, uh, as you know, the Jews uh, were very much into working, uh, for the most part, practicing a works righteousness because they had the Ten Commandments, they had the laws of God, and they sought by heeding it to be right with God. And us, today, we can think the same thing. Well, if we do uh, enough of the good things we know to be right, that somehow that would make us right with God. Or if you talk to your neighbors, it might be, well, hopefully my good outweighs my bad. Uh, but how do we know that we're ever 100% righteous? We never know that because we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glorious ideal. We can be deceived, but there's no deception like uh, self-deception. It's easy to think that we could maybe earn righteousness, but we don't have a true standard of who the righteous, holy God is because we've all sinned and, and, and fallen short. And the Jewish law was basically there to show the same thing, to show their need of a Savior too. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 3.25, now, the law was a schoolmaster or a teacher or a tutor to bring us to Christ because by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified before God himself. And if we're going to get to our heaven by our good works, then why did Jesus, the spotless Son of God, have to die on a cruel Roman cross? I mean, I dare say you could live a million lives and not make heaven because none of us are perfect. And so the question that they put there is, what must we do to do the work requires? And Jesus' response is just simplistic and it's stunning. For he answered, the work 
of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent, which of course was Jesus himself. Can it really be that simple, Jesus? No wonder Christ is a stumbling block to the Jews, and he's a stumbling block to our human pride and self-righteousness. We think, well, we can make ourselves good enough for God. What a foolishness that is, because the work of God is to believe in who uh, Jesus is and trust him completely and rest in him. And he's, when Jesus talks about believing, of course, it's not just intellectual assent like I believe uh, Jesus was a great person like George Washington was or not or believing in, in, in George Washington. It means a full and complete trust. Possibly the best definition is the faith acrostic, F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust him. And that's really what he's talking about here. He that believes on the Son of God, has eternal life. Uh, maybe the best way to illustrate it is just to think about this chair over here. And you think about this chair, uh, and let's let that chair represent Jesus Christ. Now when you think about Jesus Christ, uh, for years I knew he existed. I knew he was great. I knew he had come from God. But I didn't have eternal life because I wasn't trusting in him. I wasn't sitting in the chair of Jesus. I wasn't resting in him. I hadn't forsaken all my own ideas to trust in him. I was still doing my own thing, trying to make myself uh, right with him. Uh, and the good news is today, you can rest in him. You can trust in him. You can believe in him, the one who God has sent. And you can be assured that uh, your sins are forgiven, you're at peace with God, and that you'll go to heaven when you die. Because today, you're trusting in him and not in uh, your own righteousness or your own uh, self-doing or your own ways, uh, uh, even your own works to make you right with God because uh, the scripture says, by God's grace we're saved, as unmerited favor through Christ and it, it's uh, by faith, not by works that we've done, but by trusting in him completely. And verse 37 there, he says, and he that comes to me I'll not cast out. I remember memorizing that verse because I came to trust in Christ, uh, but then I had a lot of doubts. I mean, Jim, how could you possibly be a Christian? Look what you just thought, look what you just, said or look what we just did and so i had a lot of doubts and, and i remember memorizing that verse and dating it he that comes to me i'll not cast out and it became my assurance of salvation and today i'm still rest, trusting in christ and what he's done for me and today i know my sins are forgiven i know i'm at peace with god and i know i'm going to heaven when i die and you can know that too because you are resting in him uh, you're trusting him last sunday we had baptisms and the first question asked of the candidates was, do you have the clear witness from God that you're his child through faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Uh, because the question is one of, are you resting, are you trusting in Christ as your Savior? And that's the wonderful good news that Jesus offers here. He is the bread of life that's come from God uh, to us. And there's nothing we can do to add to uh, God's love for us, and there's nothing we can do to take away from it. Because the good news is, the, the works of God are to believe in Jesus, to put our full rest, our full trust in Jesus Christ, the one uh, that he has sent. And so that tonight when you lay your head on your pillow, you can know for sure if you died before you awake that you're right with him. The last verse there we read says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him, clings to him, trusts in him, relies on him, will have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. There's life for a look at the Savior uh, at the, for looking and trusting to him. As blind songwriter uh, Helen Lemuel put it, O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so the invitation is to look to Jesus, to trust in him completely, forsaking all I trust him as the bread of life, as the great uh, life giver today, as my great life giver, as my forgiver and leader and savior. And to live in the wonder of the fact that he is the bread of life uh, for all of us. A missionary was passing out gospels of John in central provinces of India. One man took the gospel of John and when he realized it was a Christian literature, he tore it in pieces and threw it to the ground. In the providence of God, another man shortly came by that same place and picked up the piece of torn paper to see what it was. He read words in his own language, the bread of life. He did not know what it meant and asked some of his friends if they knew the meaning of this phrase, 
One told them, I can tell you that these words are from the Christian book. You must not read it or you'll be defiled. The man thought to himself, a phrase as beautiful as this cannot defile. He bought a copy of the New Testament and read it until he found this statement, I am the bread of life. As he read and studied the passage, the light of God's word flooded his heart and he trusted Christ as his Lord and Savior. That man became a preacher of the gospel in the central provinces of India. That little piece of torn paper became the bread of life to him. Because as N.T. Wright says, what matters is not just what Jesus can do for you, like the feeding of the 5,000. What matters is who Jesus is. Only if we're prepared to be confronted by that in a new way, will you begin to understand what he really can do for you, what he really wants to do for you, because he is the bread of life. He is our life. He is your life, if you will trust him. And this is the point of the I am. It points to God himself, uh, who is a source of all we need, the blessed supplier of all goodness, virtue, sustenance, the source of salvation, our soul fuel, that which feeds us, our life itself. And it begs the question in conclusion, is Jesus truly enough for every need and desire? And if so, does my life actually reflect this belief? Perhaps, beloved one, you're tired. What are you trusting in? Uh, you're anxious, whatever. Today, the invitation is to receive and rest in the bread of life. He invites you to come to him from wherever you've been, uh, maybe tempted to live for the temporal, or carried away by anxiety, or trying to trust in your own righteousness or self-sufficiency. Today, he trusts, invites you to trust him afresh and live in vital union with him and trust him for each day's need because uh, Jesus wants to be uh, your best friend, the lover of your soul. Blackaby puts it this way. He says, whenever it seems that God is not doing anything fresh in your life, focus on the love relationship that you have with him and stay there till God gives you a new assignment because he's the lover of your soul. He is your sufficiency. He is your only source and sustenance. He is your savior and supplier. He is uh, your bread. And uh, one of the blessings of this COVID, in spite of all the hardships of it, is it invites each one of us to consider what false trust, what false bread uh, am I looking to to satisfy me? And rather to trust him completely, entirely, fully, as our salvation, as our source, our supply, our all in all, our bread eternally, and our daily bread as well. Would you bow with me in a quiet time of reflection as we usually do? And I just invite you, as we have a word of prayer, that's just to invite Jesus to speak further to you. What more might he say as we bow together? Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the bread of life. You are our eternal life today and our life for eternity. You are our daily bread the one who satisfies the staple of our lives. Forgive us for thinking other things uh, might take that place. And we just wait uh, before you afresh for whatever else you might want to say to us. And as we're bowed in quietness, I just invite you to ask, what works are you doing uh, for food that spoils? And just turn from it. And then second, are you trusting Christ, God's eternal bread from heaven for your salvation, for your forgiveness, for your righteousness with God? And then how will you trust Christ for your total soul sufficiency? How will you feed on him? Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of eating of you, of receiving you as our forgiver and our leader, our life, our all in all. Thank you for the privilege of having you be our daily bread, the daily sustenance for our souls. Thank you uh, for your amazing grace to us. In Christ's name we give you thanks. Amen.
upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you Well, beloved ones, as you head out into your week, indeed, may you know He is yours and that you are His. May His face shine upon you and keep you. May you know His smile. May you know His life-giving presence. May you know Him as the bread of your life, as your all in all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you.